Okay. You'll have to tell me. Hopefully you're just looking at the slideshow and like not by Google Chrome. Wonderful. Like magic. Okay. Amazing. So I'll give it just another minute and we are live on YouTube. So hello to everyone who's watching <laughs> before we officially, officially start. Taylor. Yeah. It's doing an echo. I think one of the two. Give me one second. Still echoing? Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll let everyone in now since we hit six. Perfect. Thank you. Alrighty. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our very first education program of 2022. I'm Taylor Roden. I'm the Community Events Manager at Historic Seattle. And our mission at Historic Seattle is saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. Um, our speakers are here. I'll introduce them in just a few minutes, as is my colleague, Naomi West. Naomi is one of our co-hosts. So if you have any questions or if you need anything, she'll be here to assist you as well. All right, let's get going. Here we go. So um, before we dive into the program, I just want to start with this. Um, Historic Seattle knows that our properties and our programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. And this acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities or for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history. But it's the first step in recognizing the people whose land we occupy. And before we get into what's gonna happen tonight and I introduce our speakers, there are a few housekeeping items, mainly some folks that we wanna thank. So we wanna start with thanking the bricklayers and allied craft workers, Local One, Washington and Alaska, Daniel's Real Estate, um, the, sorry, Daniel's Real Estate, the Greystone and Gridiron, Selen Community Foundation, Urban, Urban Villages and Railspur. And I also want to thank, I mean, of course, thanking all of our um, sponsors and partners who make our programs possible. But I really wanna thank my historic Seattle colleagues for the collective efforts in making today's program in particular possible. And I want to remind all of you tuning in and Zoom and on YouTube that this our programs are safe spaces for all participants and that sexism, 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 racism, homophobic comments, discrimination, insults, and et cetera will not be tolerated. We just ask that you all please be respectful of this space for listening, for learning, and for exploration. So tonight we are here because we have a pretty packed agenda. As you can see, we've got three mini presentations. Like I said, this is our first program of the year and it's also our first event in our new program series. And this series highlights some of our 2020 and 2021 preservation awards winners. Just to give you all some context about what this is and um, why we have invited this amazing folks to join us. Each year, Historic Seattle's annual preservation celebration benefit recognizes people and projects with awards for their achievements in historic preservation in and around Seattle. And the program series is something that we came up with so that we could get a deeper exploration of these incredible award-winning projects and the people behind them. So while we have tons of award winners, this particular series runs from today through March 12th. It includes virtual and in-person events. And our hope is that, you know, as we learn more about these projects, it will foster um, more engagement from all of you as we come into our new award season this spring. So we hope that you will nominate people and projects and um, this is just a sampling of the type of uh, amazing work that's happening in our city and the type of work that we hope to continue to recognize. So look out for that announcement this spring and um, you'll definitely hear more from us about when our actual award ceremony is in the fall. So with that, we've got um, three, like I said, amazing kind of mini presentations from all of these folks. We're gonna start with our U Heights team. Um, then we will transition to town hall with Matt and we will wrap up our evening together uh, with Pam and uh, the Magnuson, Building Nine at Magnuson Park project. 
So how all of this will really go is that we'll, I'll turn it over to them. They'll do the, sh the screen share. And at the end of each of the presentations, we'll just open it up to questions. So if throughout the presentations, you want to put your questions in the chat, that totally works. I'll be monitoring that. You're also welcome to just unmute and I'll invite you to do so um, after each of the presentations concludes. And then we'll also save some time at the very end if you're like me and you like to save all of your questions um, at the end. But other than that, I'm gonna dive right in and get started with Hunter Uechi, who is the Outreach, Outreach and Events Coordinator at U Heights. And we also have a U Heights board member, Beth Munster with us. And I'm so looking forward to hearing from the two of you. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and turn it over to both of you. And Hunter and Pam, I think what we're going to do is um, just spotlight you, if that's okay. And you can go ahead and unmute. And if you have slides to share, I will make sure that you can do that. Yes, you're good to go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can hear you both okay. now. Great. <laughs> Hunter, did you have any opening words before I do my no, presentation? I just wanted to thank um, Historic Seattle for inviting us to be here, and we're excited to share a little bit about University Heights Center with the community. Great. And I'm Beth Mountseer, uh, as I was introduced. I am a board member. I've been on the board since 2012. Um, and just a personal note, I uh, joined the board, in fact, because I used to walk past this building almost every day from an apartment I lived in to grad school down at the University of Washington. My daughter actually took some classes in the building before I was a board member, and then a local community member actually invited me to join the board. And so I've uh, been on the board for a long time, uh, had an interest in historic preservation, but didn't think I'd ever get to be involved in a building like this. So it's been a real pleasure. And uh, Beth, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I think you're on mute again. Okay, I've unmuted. Uh, I'm going to look at my notes. Hopefully that doesn't mute me again. Can you still hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear okay. you. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks. Um, so there were um, some different questions that we were asked to answer about our projects and why we were um, uh, nominated for this award. So just to start off, for those of you who aren't familiar with University Heights or what we usually call U Heights, um, it's located in the university district up at um, the cross. Well, it occupies a full block, but most people think of it as being at the corner of Northeast 50th Street and the Ave that runs north south, which is actually University Way. Um, we have a big sort of parking and playground park area at the south end of the lot. And you would also probably, uh, if you come to the U District for the farmer's market that happens every Saturday, um, that used to happen in our parking lot, but now happens in the street in front of the building on Saturdays. So University Heights, um, the school was first constructed in 1902 as an elementary school. Um, and it operated as an elementary school. It's sort of known for though in 1955, the school began recognizing the differing identities that children possess and how they can be supported in their education. The school was one of the first to develop a program for deaf children and introduced a multi-ethnic curriculum and eventually evolved into an alternative school uh, program in 1972, where teaching was based on the values of, quote, curiosity, exploration, and responsibility in an open environment. Um, due to falling um, enrollments in all of Seattle public schools, um, University Heights was one of the ones that was chosen to close, and it closed in 1989. 
the nonprofit um, U Heights was formed in 1990, and it was a loose collection of a number of people who had wanted to save the building. And they came together and um, there were some different arts groups and organizations that were operating out of there. At one point, they had an executive director who basically collected the rents from all the various people who were in there. But then in, um, in 2009, after a number of years of effort with the support of Representative CHOP and other local government funding, which included funding from the city of Seattle itself and King County, some open space funding that went to city of Seattle parks um, was all part of the mix. And the building was purchased in 2009 um, and uh, officially a nonprofit was established. Um, along with the ownership of the building came basically a 30 year laundry list of deferred maintenance that had, you know, just not happened for the building. Um, as I mentioned, I came on in 2012, but even before that, they had already started doing a lot of the work. Um, I'll just say that our last project, as I go through uh, talking about what we've done, we're about to start construction, hopefully, fingers crossed, assuming we can raise the last of the funds, we will be adding an elevator to the building to allow access for all sorts of people to be able to get to all levels of the building without dealing with our antiquated uh, sort of contraption that runs on one set of the stairs. But we will have invested nearly six million dollars in upgrades to preserve this historic landmark for generations to come. And that includes the iconic roof line. We will have renovated our historic event space, what's called the auditorium now, for community use. And we are also developing a long-term preservation strategy to continue to meet the long-term preservation needs. So what happened with our restoration project, the most recent one and others, and in terms of the funding sources that were used, partnerships, so on. Um, as I mentioned, since 2009, the staff of University Heights has been working to preserve and restore this historic gem. In 2015, we worked on a seismic retrofit and renovations of the grounds with funding and support from the Building for Communities, Washington State and Poor Culture. Um, that project involved restoring the foundations of the building. And while we were doing that work, we discovered that part of the problem was the drainage on the site was undermining the brick um, foundation and so on. So we also raised additional monies and redid and regraded the entire parking lot at that time um, around the building. But it was also when we did the work to build a new parking lot at the south end of the park that would work for multi-functions. In other words, you could clear out the parking lot and use it as a gathering space and use the park space as a performance space potentially. So all of that work was done and completed by 2015. In 2019, we also worked to repair the roof, the parapets and the cornices on the building. And that was all made possible through the support of a heritage capital project fund from the state. The MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust was our major private funder. And we also had funds from Four Culture, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture and the Norcliffe Foundation as our major funders. And that project, um, I don't know if uh, the picture, since I'm looking at my notes, it, the part of the sort of iconic nature of the school is that um, those parapets that have that curved uh, arch over the tops of the, um, some of the bays of the building. And what was happening was water had been getting, coming down the roof, but getting behind the parapets and actually running down the walls. And we were worried about them, um, well, basically uh, affecting the, the wood structure and potentially causing wood rot in the future and other sorts of things. Um, the awards that we got um, 
that have contributed that fundraising and the way we used those funds and also used what we actually do in the building to fundraise. Um, these, the restoration projects have allowed us to continue to house 12 organizations within our building that are all mostly nonprofits, but not necessarily all of them. These include six schools and after school programs that are in alignment with the founding values of the University Heights School, but more importantly, the, the, the board's priorities for the community center. And it also aligns with the requirements that the Seattle Public Schools set for who the nonprofit that was going to own the building and continue to run it. So there are, there's sort of a laundry list of things that we need to be continuing to provide in the building to meet those standards. At a certain point that will sunset, but I think we're still very committed to providing education and cultural uh, related activities in the building. We provide affordable rental and uh, space for rehearsals and performances for over a dozen theatrical groups in Seattle since 2019. And we display the artwork of over, over 20 local Seattle artists in the halls of our building. Uh, restoring the building has also given us the opportunity to expand our organization's programming to partner with human services organizations now um, that provide basic needs for unhoused community members, as well as to launch a third early learning center for low income families. Some of those activities actually are taking place on our grounds um, and not as much in the building, but that's it's all integrated into the way we work together. As I mentioned also, um, even during the pandemic, I'll just bring up, we, the, the farmer's market was really challenged by the problems they were having of um, keeping their markets running. And so we actually shared our office spaces or our staff basically moved out and we're working all remotely and we let the farmer's market occupy some of our offices. Um, so we have tried to really partner and work uh, with both the groups that are inside, but also the ones that are tangentially also, you know, using our facilities like the farmer's market. Uh, one of the questions we were also asked to talk about was how, um, what we do now, which I just went over. I mean, we're basically the, in a crude way to say, sort of the landlord for all of these organizations that we're, we're literally keeping a roof over their heads. We also have developed all of our own, um, our, we're doing our own programming. Um, we have um, initiatives that come directly from the board members where we have a whole series of programs that happen on Thursdays. We have some Zumba groups. We have a number of activities on any given night in some cases for um, uh, people who are renting the rooms, but also we are also trying to program and do more things that engage people in our community. That also includes pop-up um, sort of performances that happen at the farmer's market. And so it really is this mixture of uh, creativity, cultural and learning opportunities. Um, our mission statement really says that we're devoted to promoting lifelong learning, creativity, culture, community activism and preservation of our historic building. Um, people can email us at info at uheightscenter.org to volunteer with us or to donate to support all of our different programs at U Heights. The, the big thing that's coming up that I mentioned at the beginning is um, building an elevator that will be on the west side of the building that will allow access to really what's three different levels of the building or almost four uh, in a way because there are landings um, of, that allow access into um, some of the, uh, the rooms and facilities. And so people will be able to then use the elevator to access all levels, whereas right now they, we only have stairs within the building. Um, we've raised 
maybe Hunter can remind me. I think we're at uh, 2.2 million and we have another $300,000 to raise this year. We already have a contractor um, ready to sign our final um, uh, contract with them to do the construction. And um, we've been doing the prep work of moving uh, existing utilities that were on the site that needed to be slightly relocated and other sorts of things. This will really help us so that the entire building is accessible and it'll be an ADA upgrade that allows people to be there, but it'll also allow um, especially more flexibility also for some of the uh, children's programming and childcare facilities on the site. So we're very interested in people who might want to um, get involved. Uh, and we also have programs that, uh, that people might be interested in. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Beth. I don't wanna interrupt the, the presentation. Hunter, were you going to add anything? No, Beth covered it all. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I'd love to open it up for questions now. And I, I have a question of my own. I know, Hunter, you were sharing ways for folks to volunteer. Knowing that um, you're trying to close a $300,000 gap, congratulations, by the way. Um, are there specific fundraisers or do you have a link that we can share out with some of our folks to support you all in getting to the end of your fundraising efforts for the elevator? Yes, we do. Let me drop that link in the chat and then um, I could probably read it out to the YouTube streamers. <laughs> Um, but it's just, um, okay, go ahead. I was gonna say, I can just copy and paste it into YouTube. You know, oh, that. okay. It's just uheightcenter.org slash donate. Right. And I can add, I'm, I'm actually on the community engagement committee. And in fact, we're just getting ready to launch this last push for fundraising. We, we did a creative in fact, one, one of the funders that's back um, helping us is Murdoch. And they challenged us last year, right as we got to the point where we'd made the application, they told us we were a finalist for funding. And then they said, we want to see how well you can reach out to your community and raise funds. And in under a week, we launched a campaign that was called Five for Five. We basically wanted to show how quickly we felt we could reach out to the community and show that we could even get new donors who had never heard of us um, simply by almost, you know, like a phone tree works of people reaching out and those people reach out and so on. So it was very successful and the board also did a sort of challenge in terms of saying that we would match the funding that we raised in a two week period. So um, we don't have the specifics of our campaign, but I think you will see us reaching out. Um, we're working with a great set of architects um, uh, who may also help us to reach out, especially to the design community throughout Seattle. I'm sure Historic Seattle finds this. A lot of the people who are supporting what's happening are people who love great old buildings and like to see them stay in our community. And especially U Heights, one of the things the board has talked about a lot with the two new light rail stations, one in the university district and the other one to the north of us in Roosevelt, we are kind of the oasis in the middle of all this development. There, we're surrounded by towers and buildings going up right now. And uh, we're hoping that a lot of people will see the value of having this beautiful historic building right in the middle and improving the access. So. We don't have a formal campaign yet, but we'll be happy to send you some information on that, that maybe you can get out to your members. We would love to do that. And also the clip, I mean, I'd love to just edit what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome to, to do that yourself once it's posted sure. on YouTube. That was a great kickoff to the campaign. All right. Are there any questions for Beth and Hunter about you heights? at all, looking at all of our chats. You can also unmute if you're in this Zoom room with us. And if 
there aren't right now, we can move on to Matt. And if you come up with another question, like I said, we'll have time at the end and you're more than welcome to put your question in the chat now or throughout any of the presentations. And I'll make sure that we come back to you. All right. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you, Beth. Thanks. Awesome. So next up, we're going to hear from Matt Alps. Matt is on, or Matt worked on the Town Hall Seattle building and Town Hall Seattle, just as a reminder from the uh, slide deck, um, won our 2020 Exemplary Stewardship Award. So I'm going to switch it over to Matt. Give me a couple of mm -hmm. seconds. Thank you, Naomi. <laughs> so quick. Awesome. Well, Matt, you are now front and center. I won't steal your shine. I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Um, and if you have slides to share, you can go ahead and do that. And I will, I'll be here if you need anything. Great. Uh, thank right. you. Thank um, you. I do have slides to share. And um, it, uh, I'm interested to, uh, um, let's see, did that come up? It came okay, up. We can, we can see the outline. I don't know if you care about that or not. Oh, the outline. Yeah, let me go to full screen here. Hold on a second here. Sorry about this. Um, I can go to full screen. Okay. How's that? Great. That now we're just looking at like one slide at a time. The image. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, um, uh, definitely interested in uh, answering questions or conversation about this project. But um, I was the principal architect for the renovation of Town Hall Seattle, um, which, as um, some of you know, here's one of the original drawings. Um, uh, the building was built in two phases in 1916 and 1920, 2022 approximately. Um, and um, whoops, let's see, that's coming in as a spread, isn't it? Shoot, that isn't what I wanted. I think I'll just, hold on one second. Let me just restart this if you don't mind. I think I'm gonna use different, um, uh, different thing here. Okay. Let's try this. Okay, there we go. So we completed this uh, project in early 2020, right around, uh, I think maybe just a few weeks before the, the, the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, and in many ways, um, this is a really interesting project, I think from a couple different standpoints, but first of all, in terms of the city or in terms of culture, um, uh, I mean, it, it, I guess it goes without saying, but large church buildings were really significant um, cultural buildings, civic buildings um, in cities, um, you know, around the country um, during, um, you know, the first the 19th century and, of course, the first part of the 20th century. Um, and then you began to see, so this is a photo of, of Seattle in the 1920s, Town Hall Seattle is, or the, the building um, for, uh, for uh, Fourth Church of Christ Scientist, uh, the original building is over here on the left. And you can see Seattle was sort of a mid-rise city, um, really largely residential. Uh, commercial buildings were, you know, mid-rise up to up to low high-rise. Um, and the church buildings really had a significant role in in, in the physical uh, and cultural life of the city. That began to change, of course, after World War II um, with suburbanization and with the change in demographics. And many of many of these urban churches lost their congregations over a period of time. And so these really beautiful, significant buildings kind of lost their purpose in the latter half, latter half of the 20th century. So for us, this project was, one of the questions was, you know, how do these churches remain, these buildings remain relevant once they're no longer a church? Um, and in this case, Town Hall Seattle, which is an arts and culture organization, purchased the building and, and actually was responsible for saving it from demolition, um, and then operated the building as a lecture hall, if you will, for a number of years before hiring us to figure out how to renovate the building. And I'll get to the details in a minute, but over on the, on the, on the left are these historic photos. On the right is a rendering, but this is what, what's on the site today. There are two 420 foot towers immediately adjacent to the building, which is kind of, kind of uh, a, you know, an example of what, um, you know, what's happened in, in Seattle in particular, but also many cities, um, you know, where Seattle, as, as we all know, has um, been the, fa uh, the fastest growing city in the United States for over a decade. And, um, you know, so preservation really becomes uh, a critical. How, how do we go forward and, and, and reuse significant buildings in our, in our city? I think for, for me personally, and for um, 
the other uh, people on, on my on my team, particularly Kate Weiland, who was the uh, project architect. Um, this is probably one of the most technically complicated, challenging projects that I've worked on in my career. Um, because what we did was we took a church that was built in 1920 that was really in its original condition, and we converted it to a state-of-the-art performing arts center. And uh, that was really, really challenging to do from a, from a technical standpoint while preserving the significant elements of the building. So this diagram shows the three floors in the program um, of the building and, 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 and what we did. At the lower floor, we created um, a, a multi-venue space with a new entrance. At the middle floor, we created a lobby with different gathering spaces, different venues, and then a very large non-gendered uh, restroom facility because there were very few restrooms in the building. And then at the top floor, the, the auditorium, what was the original uh, great hall of the, of the church, we preserved that and then renovated and, and converted that to sort of the main performing arts space. Um, and in doing that, um, here's a diagram of the building. These yellow areas are what we call the interstitial spaces, these sort of in-between or gap spaces which we could use to put in all these new systems that are required to create a performing arts center. Acoustic systems, theatrical uh, systems, um, heating, ventilation, cooling, lighting systems, and, and structural systems. So it was, a re it, was, it was really like a Rubik's cube. You know, if, if, if you got one side to work, then nothing else fit. And, and really trying to thread that needle to fit all these parts and pieces into the building while preserving the interior character and the exterior character to the, to the degree possible. Um, these are some diagrams, three-dimensional drawings actually, that show all the um, new systems that we inserted into the building and mostly into these interstitial spaces. On the left are the structural systems. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but all these uh, items in red. So you're seeing the, 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 the ghost of the exi existing shell of the building and then the new structural elements that we had to insert. Because when we're transforming this building, you know, we have to bring it up to code and seismic code um, was really um, a, a, a huge effort and, and really a, a major part of this, of this project was a seismic retrofit. The seismic retrofit was, was even more challenging because of the nature of the building, which is an assembly use. There's almost 900 people that can be in the building in the Great Hall and an additional, I think, 400 people in the lower level downstairs. So that may put it into a high category of life safety design that we had to meet. In blue here, these are all the new mechanical electrical systems. So we had to put in um, air conditioning that wasn't in the building originally and a high performance um, uh, uh, heating, cooling and ventilation system that met um, acoustic standards, um, that a really quiet system in order to meet the goals of, of creating this um, really state-of-the-art performing arts center. And then on the right are theatrical and acoustic systems in addition to that, such as um, um, sound absorbing systems, lights, lighting systems, for, uh, for really putting on uh, performances um, uh, uh, that, that are needed in, in this type of a space. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the seismic retrofit that we did because we, we kind of went outside the box and came up with what I think is a hybrid sort of innovative solution to a seismic retrofit for this building. You know, typically in URM or unreinforced masonry buildings, you'll see the steel brace frames that are inserted into the building. And that's the sort of cross bracing, you know, steel verticals, it's like a ladder frame with the diagonals. Um, and that's, that's the most standard approach to a seismic retrofit. And it works a lot very well for mini buildings. For this building, however, we felt that would really be um, problematic um, in that it would have had a negative impact on the character of the space, uh, particularly the interior spaces, which are, which are really historically significant. So this is a plan diagram that shows the three different types of, of structural systems, this sort of hybrid system that we put together. One in the corners in red, um, concrete shear walls. So we, we hid these concrete shear walls in the stairwells and, and, and we were able to do that, but it was really challenging. And then in light blue, we actually did epoxy steel plates to connect the floor plates over to the corners to get that structural continuity. And then in dark blue, we had to, um, put what's called out of, out of plane bracing steel um, be, because in the, in, in the great hall, you have these really tall walls and these re, with really large openings with the stained glass windows in them. And so that required um, more structural steel. Here's a 3D diagram of all those structural elements. 
And we were able to actually conceal everything in orange, which is concrete, and red, which is steel. The only elements which are visible, which I'll talk a little bit more about, are the dark blue elements, and that's that out-of-plane out of steel. But all of this work had to go into the building. And I, I kind of use the metaphor of this, of this, if the building is, if you think of the building as a human body, we essentially did surgery on the body to open up the body and put in a new skeleton because it either didn't have a skeleton or the skeleton was inadequate to, to meet you know, current life safety requirements. So that's a kind of a radical notion if you're thinking of putting an entire new skeleton inside a body. And that's, that's I think, kind of a simple way of thinking about what we did here. Um, here's a few photos of that. So this stairwell, we actually opened up the stairwell and we put in um, a, a 12 inch thick concrete um, shear walls in the corners of each stairwell. And then we put everything back together. So on the left here, on the upper left shows the, 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 those, that concrete, those stairwells being constructed. And on the right shows the completed condition. You kind of don't really know that they're there. Um, we, we did narrow the width of the stairs um, by that amount, but because there are four stairs in the building and because we were adding fire sprinklers, we were able to do that and meet code. On the right, uh, I'm sorry, lower left is, is uh, just an image of, of some of the ductwork that we had to hide in the ceiling. And you can see that person standing there to get a sense of the size of that ductwork that had to be fitted in and around spaces that were not meant to have uh, 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 new elements uh, fit, fitting through them. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the preservation aspects. Um, the stained glass windows, if, if, if any of you have been in the building, you know they're um, a really incredible feature um, in, in the space. Um, really large stained glass windows with, an, with a really beautiful design. Um, and one of the great things about the, uh, the, 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 um, um, the um, Church of Christ Science is that there's no iconography. So it really, the building really suited itself to reuse for cultural and civic purposes because it, it didn't have a specific iconography of a, of a particular de denomination um, you know, that would define that experience. So we were able to just look at the, the beauty and the artistry of, of the historic elements and, and, and they really work well. But um, here we worked with conservators to actually, uh, the entire stained glass had to be re-leaded. So every single piece was removed, um, and was, was cataloged, cleaned, and re-leaded and put back together. Then we also installed, the, these, these photos don't show it, but we also, to protect the glass and also to improve the thermal performance of the building and the acoustic performance, we installed um, a clear glass windows on the outside. So the stained glass is now protected from damage, um, but also, allows for uh, um, that um, high level of acoustic isolation um, that's needed for a performing arts center. Um, here's a few more um, images of the preservation. Uh, for example, you see these exit signs, really beautiful stained glass exit signs. Um, and we, we relamp those with LED lights to meet um, uh, the current brightness that's required per, per a life safety code, but able to keep that um, stained glass lens, which is a really wonderful thing. Other um, light fixtures we, we, we cleaned, preserved, and relamped and rewired um, as well. And then on the top, architectural elements that we, um, um, in some cases, had to reconstruct um, where they were missing. Um, in other cases, we, we cleaned and preserved them. Um, and then we repainted everything with a sort of calm, um, more monochromatic uh, uh, paint scheme that, uh, that we think really accentuates the stained glass. Um, there was a sort of a multicolored paint scheme um, but we, we kind of wanted to go to brighten the build, brighten the space and really focus on the colors of the glass, which I think um, is, it was one of the things that we did. Um, I'll, uh, I'll show a few before and after photos of different parts of the project. This is the lower level, which is the basement. And on the upper left of this slide, you see the space as we found it. It had been remodeled in the, in, uh, in the 50s and 60s. So it, it didn't have... Um, uh, a significant amount of historic character, uh, significant that we wanted to retain, but um, we did. We so we sort of stripped it back. We got rid of all the plaster. Got ba got back to the structure to get a bit more space. Um, reopened some windows that had been partially closed off to get more daylight. And then on the bottom right, you see this sort of multi venue sort of small intimate performing spaces that we created down there. Um, also downstairs, we created a new entrance to the building. Um, on the upper left the back side of the building, but it faces downtown, we created this new entrance with a new vestibule and then a, a ticketing lobby so that you can have a completely separate 
um, 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 experience uh, 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 downstairs than, than upstairs, which has the main entrance off of 8th Avenue. And these are just a few uh, images of that space. There's a cafe, bar, and a library space that we created. And we did, you know, a bit more contemporary, but still um, focusing on the, 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 the volume of the space down here. Then we'll go up to the main level. And one of the main, um, you know, uh, challenges for the building was its lack of restrooms, lack of plumbing. And again, you know, that maybe worked for the church services in the 1920s, but for, uh, um, you know, uh, eight or 900 people attending um, an intermission-based performance, it was essentially really dysfunctional. You know, we had two toilets per gender, three stories down. And, you know, that just, you know, it, it really didn't work. So what we were able to do is find this, this um, space that had originally been a coat closet and a, and a catering kitchen, and we converted it to a, a non-gendered uh, toilet facility with 17 toilet rooms that anyone can use. And this diagram shows this sort of how we designed a, um, sort of a one direction flow so that if, if, if uh, really trying to deal with the psychology of, of mixing genders that may not be comfortable to some people, but creating a, a, a way of you can come into that space, see if there's a, a toilet room open. And these are fully enclosed toilet rooms, of course, not stalls. Use one. And then on the way out is the hand washing station that everyone uses. So that um, has ended up being a really popular, again, when we're talking about preservation, we also have to transform buildings to meet current needs. Um, and this was one of the things that we did um, in, 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 this, um, in the project. Here's another before and after. On the upper left that, that in, in the main level in the back of the building um, were some offices. And you see that image, what they, what they look like. Again, they've been remodeled over the decades. Um, we basically stripped that all back opened up the windows and created a new, a, a small sort of um, gathering space that could be used for small lectures or for events, meeting authors or performers uh, before or after the, um, the space. We found a number of elements that we preserved, signage, and on the right, um, some of those wood elements, um, those are pieces from the, um, the wood from the pipe organ, which had been decommissioned. And we, we took that wood, saved it, and we worked with artists to create furniture and art. Um, which we kept in the building. And then going upstairs to the Great Hall, on the uh, upper left is the before image. Um, you, uh, uh, you know, you can see the speakers were sort of mounted on poles um, and there was sort of light fixtures that sort of attached kind of wherever. Um, we um, kept what was important in that space, which I think were the pews, um, the stained glass, of course, and the architectural detail and the, the volume. And then on the bottom right is the renovated um, element or the renovated space. And in the back there, you can you might be able to see in, in sort of gray that steel that I mentioned that sort of curves around the, um, the, uh, the stained glass. That's the new structural steel that had to be exposed. But we, we shaped it and, and we designed it, I, we think, to be compatible with the shape of the stained glass, not detract from it. Um, and that, that was a key element. Um, above the stage is this really big new curved element. It's an acoustic reflector that houses um, a whole bunch of theatrical components um, that allows the space to, um, to, to, to function technically for a wide uh, array of, of lectures, music, acoustic music, um, um, amplified music, spoken word music, um, um, and, and uh, as well as lighting features that are needed for, for theatrical performances. So that element, again, is a contemporary element, but we shaped it to be um, distinct from the historic uh, elements and hopefully try to fit that in there. Um, we did create some slots in the ceiling, again, for um, acoustic, uh, 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 for um, theatrical elements and for HVAC distribution. And I've got a few more images here. Here's another view of the space looking the other way as it's complete. We, we retained the pews. Um, as I said, we had to make some modifications to get um, to meet accessibility, to create some spaces for um, uh, wheelchair patrons and to do a few other things. But, um, but the pews were, I, we think, um, a real um, a significant um, experience of the space. We wanted to keep those. Um, there, in this image, you can't quite see it, but there had been an elevator installed in the back of the room in the 1960s, which we felt was really unfortunate because it really carved up the space and, 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 and sort of damage the, um, the volume, the, the historic volume. And so we got rid of that elevator, reclaimed that space, and then created a new elevator backstage 
that um, that that worked better functionally because it connected all the levels and also didn't have a negative impact on the on the character of the room. And then just a couple more images here, um, and then I'll open up for a conversation. I don't want to talk too long. This is again an image of the of the restored stained glass in one of the walls, and then you're seeing the steel. You can get a sense for how big it is by these two figures here, these two human figures. It's really big pieces of steel that we had to insert in this building. Um, and, and again, most of it, 95% of it is concealed, um, but this is the steel that we were unable to conceal. And you can see it here in the space. And, and we worked closely with the, um, the uh, State Historic Architect and the Seattle Landmarks Preservation Board and um, um, had their support for this approach um, of this exposed steel, which in, in my mind from as an architect, it, it, I, I feel like there's something to be said for having a dialogue between old and new elements with preservation. We don't always have to hide everything and pretend we didn't do anything. In this case, we really did transform the building. And maybe it's, it's interesting for that to be part of a, a, in conversation, the new elements visually with the historic elements. Um, here's an, an image of the, of the space with a performance underway. And again, seeing that stained glass really um, present in the space. And then last image is the exterior of the building today um, in use, you see people coming and going. So the building, you know, really has a new life as a, as a major civic and cultural facility in downtown Seattle, um, as opposed to, um, you know, um, being lost, uh, being torn down and replaced. Um, and so I think um, from our standpoint, that's um, one of the big successes of the project that we found a new a way to really preserve and reuse this building. Um, again, a major project here, the overall cost was about $30 million. Um, so really a tremendous effort um, by everyone involved in the project, not just us as the architect, but on the ownership side, fundraisers, um, um, board members, community members, and, and all the other um, individuals who worked on this project over the course of, of about, I don't wanna get this wrong, but I think we worked on this for at least five years from start to finish. So there you go. That's our Town Hall Seattle uh, project. Thank you so much, Matt. That was awesome um, and very thorough. My mind is kind of spinning with questions. Like I, I read obviously our Historic Seattle Award Program journal, so I knew <laughs> um, the things that you all did, but really hearing it in detail, I'm impressed and kind of blown away that you all accomplished all of that in just five years. It's a lot. It a lot of awesome stuff. So uh, does anyone have questions for, for Matt? Feel free to either put them in the chat or just unmute yourself. We're a, a small, nice, intimate group. Welcome to do that. There's one in the chat. Oh, good, let's see. Um, oh, it came to me. It was, it's a comment. Oh. Um, as Town Hall was a beautifully, beautifully executed project. I think Historic Seattle had tours during construction. That was before my time. So Historic Seattle folks on the call, please chime in. Um, and Mark says he really appreciated the tours and can't wait to see um, the completed work. And Town Hall is open actually yep. right now. They're doing programs. I think some of them are in person. Some of them are hybrid. You can watch online and in person, but I'll put that in our chat so that you all can see what they're up to over there. Yeah, I encourage anyone, everyone to go. Um, it's really a wonderful experience now. The building is fully accessible, again, um, for, for uh, all, people with all abilities. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of great programming and they are uh, back open. So they're, they're, they're doing, um, not maxing out their spaces. They, I think they have a good um, a safety protocol for uh, uh, COVID. And we went, um, my, my wife and daughter and I went to see um, a cellist perform um, a couple weeks ago and it was a really, really wonderful experience. I'm just gonna check YouTube and see if there are any questions over there. Nothing over there. Anyone else have questions or comments? I have a question just as a newbie to preservation <laughs> um, for you. I still feel like a newbie. I guess just hearing all of the, there's so many moving parts to something um, that has of this scale. Yeah. Which piece of this was the most challenging um, 
for you all to figure out. I mean, especially when you start going into the stained glass, I was like, wow, yeah. that's really tedious work. And I know yeah. that, but seeing it, I was like, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a great question. I, I, the stained glass was really tedious work. We, we didn't actually, as the architect, we didn't do that. There are conservators who were hired to do that. So for our standpoint, that was pretty easy. I think the structural work, two things, the structural work and the, and the mechanical work were, were probably the most challenging. Structural work because, you know, it's this building is a relic and, and you have to, it has to be redesigned to meet stringent, stringent seismic uh, safety code. And we actually had to go, our structural engineer, uh, you know, we went, had to go up in the attic and cut out a piece of steel, uh, that, uh, of the steel trusses that support the roof because it was not known how strong that steel was. There was no documentation. So we had to cut a piece of steel, send it to a lab, have it uh, tested. They essentially put it in a machine and pulled it until, it until it tore in order to understand how strong it was in order to understand how to design the new elements. So uh, there's just incredible amount of, 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 that, of that that went into it. And then also the mechanical system, the, the duct work, the, the new heating, cooling, ventilation system, and fitting that in the building was, I, I can't really overestimate how difficult that was. And, uh, and then, and, uh, but it, it really took a lot of effort by the, the architect team and the engineers and the contractors to, to, to make that work. And there was a fair amount of, of um, problem solving on site during construction, um, you know, that, that, that went on on a daily basis. And there's a, there's a question that just popped up in the chat that I think we both can see. Um, who are the other members of the design team aside from building work? Oh, good. That's great. Um, there Thank were... you, Michael, for the question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the uh, structural engineer is um, Magnuson Flemensic Associates. Um, uh, they're one of the premier structural engineers in the country, and they're based here in Seattle. Um, the um, mechanical engineer um, was uh, Mazzetti. Um, the um, electrical engineer was um, originally they, they, when we started they were sparling but they became somebody else uh, as they were as they merged. Um, there was lighting designer was Blanca uh, lighting design. Um, there the acoustic in, uh, uh, consultant was a really significant. We did a, a search and we hired a national expert in theatrical acoustics. Their name is Jaffe Holden from Connecticut, and they were involved in all the uh, uh, acoustic design. Um, we had um, um, an interior designer, um, Amy Baker, who um, helped uh, uh, with certain design elements. Um, and I think there were others. The general contractor, of course, was Raffin Construction, local firm, um, um, well known for, for um, uh, historic renovation projects. Um, and then of course, there was a whole host of subcontractors, um, too many to name on the, on the contractor side. So that's just a few, I'm sure I missed, I missed some, but those are some of them. Thanks, Matt. And everyone, when I send the follow-up email that includes the link to the actual recording of this, I'll also include the link to our benefit journal that actually includes the project teams for each one of our award winners, including this one. I think if you're looking at that now, I, I want to say town halls on like page 10, 11, don't quote me, but you'll get that in email form. So, all right. Are there any other questions for Matt? Cool. Thank you, Matt, that was awesome. Thanks. Um, and we're gonna move right along to Pam. Pam, are you ready? I can't see you, so I'm gonna... Yes, I'm ready. Awesome. And I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if you can, can you all see that? Yes, we can. It looks great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about Mercy Magnuson Place today, uh, which is the current name of the building. Uh, originally called Sandpoint Building 9. And building 9 was the enlisted barracks for the Sandpoint Naval Air Station. And just as a way of introduction for myself, when I did this work, I was both principal and, and project architect at Tonkin Architecture. I'm currently with SMR Architects, and SMR very fortunately does the exactly the same type of work, historic preservation and affordable housing. I very love the, the, the uh, socially responsible nature of the work that we do. Um, so, so, so building nine is, uh, so this is the map of San, Sandpoint Naval Air Station in 1944 and its heyday. Um, and in this, in this, on this map, north is to your left. And 
so starting in the 1920s, the, the Navy filled in the swamps that were here and built their runways. And they built a lot of buildings, which are down here, including building nine, which is this long one here. And this is the, in, by 1944, this is really the height of the station during World War II, there was a real big buildup. And after that, there was less and less need for a Naval Air Station in Seattle. So eventually they built the um, Naval Air Station became Madison Park, which you probably a lot of you have been there now, North is what you'd expect to be on top. Um, so that happened in the early 90s. And the, of course the runways are gone. Some of the wetlands have been restored. There's lots of parks, park functions, playing fields. And then there've been many uses for the various buildings. A lot of them are park facilities like the community center, artist studios, all kinds of things, lacrosse. Um, but building nine, instead of going to the city of Seattle, originally it was, went to the state of Washington and there was thoughts that the University of Washington would be able to make use of the building. But this is a huge building. It is over 800 feet long. This is, oops, wrong way. Uh, here's a current picture of it. So just think of the space needle on its side. It was very expensive for University of Washington to do anything with it. So they didn't do anything. For 25 years, nothing was done to this building, no maintenance of any sort. When the Navy had left it, it was still usable, which was not, but not the case by the time our project started in 2017. And so the, um, in this picture, the, the north up here was the oldest barracks and there was the center was the mess hall and the south was more barracks. And to give you a feel for what, how the building was originally, this is pl plans from 1944. One of the great things for this project was is that we had a lot of records from the Navy. The Navy kept very good record, records and the University of Washington has them all. So we were, had tons and tons, hundreds of plans for this building. But it was originally start built starting from the north and it kept start, starting in 1929 and expanded. And then in 44, the massive building built all the, the, all the south dorms and the mess hall. And you can see each dorm or barrack was one, each bay was one barrack. And they really intended to function separately. There was, there was barracks and then the head, the restrooms in between and lots and lots of stairs and doors. So pe the people, the pe listed people would come out of there and then they walk outside to go to the mess hall. They didn't, they were never able to walk through the building. So it was very split up. And then after World War II, the Navy didn't need all this, they, but they put other functions in. They really broke it up into a warren of offices. So those big open spaces were mostly no longer present. The things that of his, on the inside of the building that were historic in nature were the, all the stairs. So these pink areas are the stairs. But the rest of the interior had been greatly changed over the years. This is the, the lower level or basement, the first floor, and then the second floor and the third floor, which is an attic with dormers. And the, um, the mess hall is only on the basement and first floor levels. So to give you an idea of what this is like on the inside, this is an office, which would have been totally usable when the Navy left, but by the time um, sitting for 25 years was no longer at all use, usable. There's a lot of mold and mildew, asbestos lead. We, when we first went into the building, we had to go in hazmat suits. Um, and this is, we see the really, this is paint at, under a roof leak here in one of the heads on the third floor. So really the extreme conditions. Um, and then on the exterior, the Navy had replaced the windows in the 1980s. And then there were huge problems with vandals breaking the building. So the state eventually boarded up the windows. They had um, chain link up here on top of the mess hall to try to keep the vandals out of climbing on top. So it was a really extremely bad shape. Um, so, and this is a plan, the first floor plan, what we did with it. So our client, Mer Mercy Housing Northwest, uh, won, uh, gave the winning proposal to take control of the building, to take it from the state. And they didn't have to pay money for the building because there was plenty to pay for in taking care of the building um, to, to, re to reuse it for affordable, affordable workforce housing. Interestingly, Frank Chop was also very involved in this. Frank, Frank Chop has been really a great friend for uh, historic preservation and affordable housing. So, um, and so the, the, both the North and South became affordable workforce housing. 
and the center became supportive services for the housing and a daycare and a small health clinic. And one of the challenges of this um, reuse of the building was to create a connected whole out of this very long disconnected building. So you can see we created pathways all the way through going north south and all the way through going in east west. Um, and this building, uh, Sandpoint point is up here on the west side of the building, but the, on the west side is really the back of the building. It's where the Navy had their loading docks. So we had more um, flexibility in changing this area for new uses such as playground and parking and regrading it. Um, one of the important things was to have accessibility from the bus stops on Sandpoint Way so that somebody could get around the building and get into the park. And then on the east side of the building is the formal landscape, which is is as historic as the building and was very much protected. So very much less change on the east than on the west. And I'm going to talk about the outside building and the outside the building and then move inside. So this is what it looked like at the center east at the old mess hall um, with the chain link, the old the windows that have been replaced, these odd awnings, awnings and doors have been replaced. Trees have grown out of control. Um, and this is what it looks like today after restoring it. We, the windows are new, the doors are replacements, the gutters and downspouts are replacements, but there's a lot of what was originally here, still here. And this is what it looks looking down the, the length of the uh, east side of the building, a mixture of some um, old elements and some new like fan lights are restored, some of the doors are restored, and some are, are new to fit with the spaces there. And one of the challenges is of this is that like many old buildings, there are a lot of steps into the building. So the one the few changes on the front, uh, this is another one of the terraces, a few changes on the on the east side were to add some ramps. There's a ramp on the south and the and on the north. And this is the in the oldest part of the building with a big terrace and these doors are all restored. Um, now, switching to the west side of the building, this is these loading docks, which are historic and were important to preserve, but very difficult to have an entrance with these loading docks like this, um, with the grade going down like this, or to make accessible parking. So we really regraded the whole thing. And this was, um, in, we had funding from the National Park Service where historic tax credits and of course also landmarks, Seattle Landmarks Review. But here the, um, the loading dock is still there, but we brought the grade up to it and there are plantings around it. So it's like a little island. So you can see, still see the footprint of it, but you can walk into the building and accessible entrance. So this is the main west entrance to the building. And this area has been brought up quite a bit in order to create a playground for the childcare. Um, and on the west side of the building, we also needed to create housing in the basement. And the basement had light wells, but it didn't really have sufficient windows to make what you call a garden apartment. So we were able to both lower the windows so they were not gonna be up above the ceiling and, and increase their height so that there are good windows in the basement now. And we did this very carefully sticking with the alignment of the windows above. So there's not a distraction to the whole, um, the, the, the order of the building. And you, in this picture, you can also see el the elevator penthouse was one of the few the ex interior changes coming to the outside because you really need elevators. Um, and then so here you can see the new windows going in in one of these so Southwest courtyards. And in this picture, you can see both what one, so what one of these courtyards look like originally or it, before construction started and what it looked like when it was finished, where it's all planted and graded down. And um, this is sections showing what, what that change. And this is what, how we, part of how we discussed it with both landmarks and the National Parks. It was giving them views of before and after because they could understand the effect of the what the change would be. Here, this shows how extreme the grade was here. This is well, opening a vault to the steam tunnel down there. Um, but really diff a difficult grade to live with. So here it has how it's been regraded where the area down here has been 
raised up and the area here has been lowered so it's much less steep and there's accessible entrances into these apartments. These, these doors on this side go directly into apartments. Um, and on this side, you can also see the, all the original dormers here, but we weren't allowed to add any new dormers. Uh, the National Park Service felt very strongly about that, but we were allowed to add skylights. So this is one of the new skylights there. And now switching to the inside of the building. The, after sitting for 25 years, the inside of the building was in horrible condition, just so full of mold and mildew, and most of it not historic. So it was, we totally gutted most of the interior down to the building has a concrete frame with brick infill on the walls. And you can see they have, there's a bobcat bat. It basically the, the demo crew was going around and like, like, like you would see on the, uh, an exterior construction site with their bobcats pulling all this material out, but doing it all in hazmat suits. And one of the things that we continually uncovered was this um, hull clay tile. It was used for fire resistance and it's effective for fire resistance. However, it is very bad in an earthquake because it is hollow, it falls apart in an earthquake. So wherever we uncovered hollow clay tile, we either had to reinforce it or remove it. In this, ca this case, it was behind a stair. So this was reinforced so that it wouldn't fall down. But eventually we got to where the interior is all cleaned out we left down to the frame and brick and um, slab floor, concrete slab floor. And these are concrete columns that the Navy, Navy plastered and painted excessively. One of the, the uh, sayings is that if somebody's standing around in the Navy, they'll give it a paint brush until they paint something. And I think that really applies to building nine, plenty of paint on the side of building nine. But after taking the building apart to that extent, the new apartments, there are 148 new apartments really are like new apartments. Um, this is a typical apartment. It's got new flooring, new finishes, new electrical, new mechanical, everything new, except you can see, you can, except you have the pattern of the, of course, the, the, the windows and the actual volume of the space. And here the wall has been burned out to add insulation because the building did not have insulation. But and so that's a typical apartment where it's like a new space in an old building, but there were some spaces where we were able to bring more of the character of the building out. These are in the um, resident services areas for, for Mercy Housing Northwest, where we were able to restore the terrazzo floors. And you can see a terrazzo base on the concrete column, which we've also restored the finish on that. And this is in the north at the, oh, oh, there was a, the original old mess hall where we were able to, again, show that we have the restore the terrazzo. This is 1929 terrazzo and have some of the terrazzo base exposed where we didn't add insulation for this small area in order to have that. And then these doors are all restored. And now switching gears to what, what we didn't gut. This is one of the south stairs. Um, this is a concrete stair, and these are original doors that were restored. This is what it looked like in 2012, and this is what it looked like during during demolition, where the doors were removed for restoration. Again, we're down, back down to con concrete and brick, and this is the top of one of these stairs, where it's beautiful concrete work here, but unfortunately, it's only 36 inches tall, so it's not tall enough to be a guardrail, and this is a real concern. Um, this is family housing, we were not safe to have it like that. So we had to think about how to both preserve this and make it safe. And so we added a little wall on top of that, but we kept a separation. So when it's completed, you can see that line between the old and new. This is the restored third story of the uh, south stairs and then here you can see some of the dormers and kind of unusual to have a slope ceiling within a stairwell um, and to have these low ceiling areas and that's why these additional railings in here they're called cane rails there so a blind person won't hit their head they'll, they'll, they'll find the, ca the cane rail before they hit their head and then this is what the first floor of that stair looks like the con restored concrete stair with the added height at the railing and this is not where we're now created the connection all the way through and these are fire doors. So in a fire, the doors would close, uh, but you can walk all the way through from north to south there. 
And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that center area, center area um, which was originally the mess hall. And you can see one skylight there, there were additional ones, but this area was really in exceptionally bad shape. Um, this, the, the, the orange is steel. And then you can see this, this the, the rest of the roof sheathing about to fall down. Um, just horrible leaks through this roof failure without maintenance. And this is one of the, the kitchen area back there just falling apart. We could see daylight through it when we started construction. And it really needed a massive amount of work. So here, this is what it looked like in the middle of construction where just the old steel is left and had to be completely rebuilt. Um, and this area, this is what became the childcare. And um, the, this lighter yellowish area here is the trousseau that we were able to restore. And then out here, there had been a porch the Navy had enclosed and they had also hidden these windows that were originally between the mess hall and the porch and those were intact. So we just had to uncover those and clean them up and they were, they were good to go. So those we were able to save. But unfortunately in the, uh, this is that, that um, porch or so they called it a solarium. The, 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 the ceiling was in just as bad shape as everywhere else. So this beautiful coffered ceiling had to be, we couldn't save it. It was just too rotten. and we had to uh, re re reconstruct it. But here, the, those are these are the original those original windows that you saw in the other picture, and this is where we're going to replace the windows. And this is rebuilding the ceiling while also adding HVAC to it. And then this is what the space looks like today, with the, you know, on the right are the original windows, and the left are the new exterior windows. And the ceiling the ceiling is all reconstructed, and the floor is a mixture of old and new. Some of it's original quarry tile, and some of it is replacement. And um, Mercy Housing can do a variety of functions here, including they have a food bank in there. And this is what it looks on the other side of this window, where the corridor continues through between north and south. And here's what it looked like before, before construction. Um, and then I just real quickly, I want to tell you a little bit about the third floor. This is a typical condition we encountered on the third floor. There were a lot of roof leaks, but the Navy had really kind of abandoned the third floor, so they hadn't broken up as much, so you could still get a feel for the openness, but there was just roof leak after roof leak up there. But, um, and this is different than the rest of the building in that the roof structure is wood. So you can see the brick meeting the wood and the wood structure here above the lower concrete structure. And that, for a seismic retrofit, that had to be tied to the concrete, and that's what these steel struts are that we this is part of the seismic, which is one of the few places where it was exposed. And here you can see one of the, what will be one of the skylights. And that's what this space looks like as an apartment um, with the skylight and the, the, those steel struts hidden in these little walls. And these third floor apartments, because we could only add a few windows, the few skylights, they, had, they tended to be quite large because of the limitation of windows and because of the limitation of that the low ceiling spaces don't count towards the space. They're really quite spacious and kind of fun. And this is what the, the typical third floor corridor looks like with, with a succession of dormers along the way. And um, I, this is my team at Tonkin. And, but it really takes what we did in this, what we did in this building with 148 apartments, it really built a village and it really takes a village to build a village. So this is everybody who worked, or most of it, it doesn't include the subcontractors even, that would be pages and pages, but the key players, uh, Mercy the owners, Mercy Housing Northwest, and again, the Raffin Company, the same, same contractor that was working on Town Hall and our, um, our design team, I.O. Gross, structural engineers, Potter Engineering with Civil, Karen Keys, landscape architects, um, WSP, which is the MEP engineer, our historical consultant, Kate Kraft, who I think you folks at uh, Historic Seattle know well. And um, then we had all the environmental testing by PBS, and we had envelope consultants, and we had a geotechnical engineer and acoustic consultant, and then we had the, the tenants, the, the um, Denise Louis Education Center that runs the um, education center there, the preschool and their architects, Environmental Works, and then Neighbor Care that runs the health clinic, and their architects, Millie Hayashi. And that, I think that's about it. 
Thank you so much, Pam. That was awesome um, and very thorough. And thank you for all of the photos. I know unlike the other two buildings, this is housing, so we're not able to go and, and visit. So it was really great to see, especially the, um, the process <laughs> photos. I didn't realize, you know, just the condition of the buildings. Like, oh my gosh, love seeing um, the end project. It's like, wow, y'all really did that. So thank you. You're welcome. And we'd we'll, we'll love to open it up. Um, questions for Pam, really questions for, for anyone, any one of our presenters, if you have a question for Matt, Pam, Hunter, Beth, now would be the time to either pop your question in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself. And I'm gonna slide over to YouTube and see if there are any questions over there. I don't see anything over there. Okay. Um, there's a question that came to me for you, Pam. Um, what was the carpeting that was in the hallway, those hallways? Carpeting? There was there the um the 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 finish the final floor in the hallways is, is um well on the first floor there you know, okay there is carpeting there's carpet tile on the upper floors um and there and then there's um luxury vinyl tile on the lower floor that was quite controversial because Mercy Housing would normally they do vinyl plank but the 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 concrete structure of this, the, the concrete slab, the floors are only six inches thick. So it was, we were really concerned about sound going through them. So that is why we did carpet tile on the upper floors. And of course there's acoustical ceiling below too, but it's still, it's just really the sound with such a thin slab was really an issue. Um, so that's why we went with the carpet tile. It's just a standard carpet tile. I think it was by, uh, it's either by Mannington or Pat Craft. I can't remember which. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Um, I have a question for our U Heights team. I know that you all are also doing programming, but wanted to ask, do you all give tours of the building? I know that you have tenants in there. So I'm just curious if folks wanted to see the building, but perhaps not come to one of the awesome events. I don't know, you should go to their events, but if you want to see the building, would love to hear from um, you. I guess, Hunter, this is more your world, like how folks can check out what you've done in the building over the years. Yeah, currently our building isn't open to the public just because of COVID protocols, but we are hoping to host an event for our artists in the building because we do have a lot of, as Beth was saying, we have over 20 artists, local Seattle artists that are displayed on the walls of our building. And we are looking to hopefully open up our building again to have those art pieces as well as the rest of the building to be seen. So stay tuned. Currently we're not open, but hopefully soon. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Have... That was my mistake. Sorry. Oh, I was that was my mistake. Yeah, I was looking we, on have your... done, we have done tours in the past at certain times, and I think we usually announce them on the um, on our website that has events and um, those sorts of things. We also, um, Hunter didn't mention it, but we have a group that leads ghost tours <laughs> in University Heights, um, usually in the evenings. And uh, I have to admit, I have not been on one, but uh, I've heard they're a lot of fun. <laughs> so. Mo most of our sort of like the presentation, I was really impressed with both of the other presentations, but I was just gonna say, a lot of our work is all hidden. All that parapet work, you know, is we had people up in the attic. We had broken um, uh, some of the major uh, structural members, or we had one at least cracked roof, um, one of the joists and so on. But most of our work, you almost can't see we, you know, the, we have done some other restoration work inside, like we have restored all the floors over time. The stairs are still though, um, you can see the wear and tear of students for, you know, close to over a hundred years going up and down the stairs. But mo most of our major projects, you wouldn't know because they were structural in nature. The elevator will be the first thing that is a really big change. And when we restored the auditorium, it had always been a, a small uh, 
performance space that actually had a very high stage in it that was dangerous and we converted it to a much more flexible space. But um, uh, a, a, a lot of it is sort of hidden, but yes, you can see the, the classrooms are still the same in a lot of ways. Thank you for that. And I realized my own error. I looked on your website and saw that you were doing programming, but I didn't read closely enough because <laughs> some of the programming I can see is not happening in the building just yet. So thank you for clarifying that for me. And I know that um, Matt had to take off at the top of the hour. So if you all have questions for him, you're more than welcome to reply to the follow-up email that I'm going to send. And I'd be happy to pass those along. Um, Thank you, Sarah, for your comments. Um, Sarah, thank you all for your projects. And I agree, it's definitely very impressive. I'm blown away. <laughs> um, but yes, before we end our time together, I would love to either take any last minute questions or if three of you have things that you wanna say, any final finals, things that you'd like us to do or follow or um, support. Now I guess would be the time to share your last minute comments with us and then we'll end our time. And you don't have to <laughs> at all. I know your presentations are very thorough. So if well, I'm just going to comment that I've been in University Heights and it is a wonderful building. I, I enjoyed seeing it very much, but it's quite different in that you haven't emptied your building. You continue to use it and do all these projects around all that activity. The, the sort of things that happened at Town Hall and Mercy Magazine Place could not have happened while the building was occupied. It's, it's a very right. different type of project. So that the continuous operation of the building is very impressive. It, it has been interesting and a, a challenge. And in fact, right now we're in the process of designing and getting ready to install restrooms for another um, childcare facility that's going into the building or being upgraded. Um, but yeah, when I also think about the future, uh, our list of projects, one of the next things we'll have to get to are all of our windows especially the south and west exposures where the most damage has occurred to those wood window frames. I'm trying to, just thinking about it in the future, it'll be a gigantic game of Tetris. Of, I don't know. But I was going to say the same thing, Pam, of um, I just happened to have for a couple of years was working out at the Magnuson tennis. I wasn't playing tennis there, but I was out. So I always had just loved that the barracks, you know, even before they were restored, but to see them now um, is just amazing. And uh, I just contribute so much back to that, to the character of that neighborhood in a way of, um, and knowing that there's, you know, people and families living there again, I think it's just wonderful. It was a beautiful oh, job you. that you did. Yeah. Thank you. No, it was really interesting when we took the construction fences down for the first time, instantly there were people walking their dogs around their building. Really the, yeah. the people beyond the people in the building benefit from right. it because it was really in such bad shape, but in such a prominent location. Yeah. It's great to see just people walk around the building and enjoy it inside and outside. Yeah. Um, I agree. And <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. This is awesome and a beautiful kickoff to this series. And um, all three of your projects are definitely in the spirit of why we have the awards in the first place. So thank you for the work that you do. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This was really fun. And um, we have three more coming up. Those are all in person. And I'll include them in our follow up email as well. One of them is sold out. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. There's a wait list, but you can message me if you'd like to be put on that wait list. And uh, with that, we're going to end our time together. Looking forward to seeing you all again soon. And again, Pam, Beth, Hunter, and I know uh, Matt had to go, but thank you really for your time today. This was awesome.